Lex was a show I got constant requests to do a video on, and I finally did back in June. In short, I found it weird, confusing, but also kind of fascinating. After my mixed reaction to it, many Lex fans in the comments implored me to check out Season 2. I did, and... I am equally as confused, freaked out, yet still somehow kind of interested. Now before we get stuck in, if you like what I do and want to help the channel grow, join me over on my Patreon or through my YouTube members where you can see videos early as well as gain access to new behind the scenes videos and many other benefits. Now with the shameless plug out of the way, let's get stuck in. A big criticism I had with the previous season was the overall presentation of the show, and this continues to be an issue in season 2 as well. Lex was simply way too ambitious with its concepts compared to its budget, and the general resources of TV shows at the time. Lots of big ideas and visually spectacular sequences, which the show just doesn't have the ability to pull off. Last time I made this criticism, I saw a lot of folks saying that that was simply the best technology could do at the time, but that's not really true. This show was airing at the same time as Babylon 5, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager, and all of those shows hold up a lot better. It's not just the CGI shots in Lex, the miniature work as well isn't very good. There's not a single shot where a model doesn't look like a model. The CGI isn't as good as Babylon 5 CGI, and the miniatures aren't as good as Star Trek's miniatures. Farscape was also running at the same time, and its makeup and creature effects easily exceed Lex. Ambition should always be commended, yes, but perhaps the production team should have reined in some of their bigger ideas so their resources could have been better allocated. That being said, the set design for the Lex itself has certainly improved. I always felt like Season 1's bridge set was kind of all over the place, but in Season 2 it's a lot more coherent and visually appealing. So there's one notable improvement. Now when talking about the stories of this season, I will confess I didn't watch every single episode. I wasn't enamoured by Season 1 and Season 2 was 20 episodes long, so I decided to go with the highest rated episodes on IMDb and did some more googling to make sure I was seeing the essential episodes. That way I was sure to watch the episodes which Lex fans collectively liked the most and which the creators of the show thought were most important. I'll be getting into more detail later in the video, but first I wanted to address a big part of Lex stories which is sex. I mentioned this in the previous video, but it only became more overt in season 2. This show is obsessed with sex. Entire characters and their arcs are built around sex, numerous stories have sex as a major plot device, there is sexual imagery all over the production design. My issue with all of this is not bringing up sex as a concept, but what the point of any of it actually is. This isn't like a David Cronenberg movie where sex and sexuality are used as tools for character introspection and social commentary. At least, I'm failing to see Lex actually make any kind of statement about sex. If sex is supposed to be used for comedy, I don't really see any actual jokes being made aside from huh, boobs, which left me thinking perhaps it's just sex for the sake of sex. Just completely gratuitous. This did air on a cable channel after all, and season one did feature some full frontal nudity, but even then, Lex never goes that extreme stream with its content. If you want your show to exist purely for sensational, gratuitous fun, go the heavy metal route. If you're gonna swing, swing for the fences. It just keeps bringing up sex over and over and over again in every other episode. It doesn't have anything to say about sex, doesn't have any good sexual jokes, and frankly, isn't sexy enough to justify its constant insertion into the stories. Instead, the sexual aspect of the show comes off as sleazy and awkward most of the time. I'm sure for some 13-year-olds who watched the show at the time, this blue their minds, but as an adult, this just left me scratching my head. This season saw the departure of Eva Haberman as Zev and replaced by Xenia Seberg via some death, transformation, and rebirth shenanigans. My thoughts from the previous video were that Eva Haberman actually had some screen presence, but the character of Zev was usually just captured, tortured, and in need of rescue in each episode, which really undercut the potential of her character. Xenia Seberg is pretty much in the same boat, although she gives a weaker overall performance, or rather, an inconsistent one. Sometimes she embodies a fun charisma and wit, other times she looks completely lost in the scene. Sometimes she manages to display a full range of sincere emotion, but other times her attempts at big emotions are utterly cringeworthy. This could be the result of bad direction, but I feel like she never quite settled in the role. Brian Downey as Stanley Tweedle was... irritating. I thought following the finale of season 1 we might see the character go through some significant change, but most of the time Tweedle is back to square one as a cowardly, spineless, and whiny moron. A huge chunk of his dialogue is still just begging Zev for sex, despite her constant refusal, which makes him pretty damn unlikable. 
The best dialogue exchanges he has are with 790, who I neglected to mention in my previous video. Honestly, 790 was kind of my favourite. The vocal performance was good, and I was well behind his hatred of Tweedle. My actual favourite, though, was still Kai. Michael McManus is just so cool. His deep voice and straight-to-the-point style is a breath of fresh air when compared to the obnoxiousness which often surrounds him. While his wrist-mounted grapple thing is pretty lame, he does succeed in being the competent badass of the group. His hair still looks stupid, though. Getting into the best-slash-worst episodes, this season did start strong-ish with Mantrid. Under the influence of the Divine Shadow, Kai leads the Lex to Mantrid, the Divine Shadow's bio-vizier in the hope of bringing the last remaining insect larva to life so that the insect civilization might rise again. First off, I'm glad this opening episode actually clarified the history of the Insect Wars and its relevance to the League of 20,000 Planets. This was something which wasn't made very clear in Season 1 and something I misunderstood. Although it seems a bit reset buttony to immediately leave the Dark Zone and return to the Light Universe after the characters had fought tooth and nail to escape. Like, they went through all this effort to get more proto-blood for Kai, and then when he suddenly says he needs more, no one questions this. The character of Mantrid certainly raised an eyebrow. I absolutely love this design. It is so strange and so original, and actually one of the few instances where the VFX are generally strong. Although there are some unconvincing CG limbs flying about, most of the time Mantrid is made up of practical elements which have been composited into the shot. CG is only used for the background elements. That being said, although it's a really cool character design. God, the actor was annoying. Dieter Laser, is his name really Laser? That's cool. For some reason delivered every word in the same irritating, wailing tone. It's like he's always on the cusp of shouting, but never fully commits. Once again, I think this is a problem with the direction, as this actor has been genuinely entertaining in other stuff I've seen him in. Laika, which saw the introduction of Xenia Seaberg as Zev following Zev's apparent death in the previous episode Terminal, was truly baffling. While a plant lady resembling someone from Tweedle's dreams shows up on the Lex, the crew encounter astronauts from a planet called Potato who are the first to venture into deep space from their world. When their spacecraft is accidentally destroyed, the Lex takes them back home, but Laika starts picking off the astronauts one by one. Once again, I have no idea if this was an episode which was going for comedy, surrealism, or something else entirely, but it is really strange how Tweedle and Kai pretty much do nothing while a carnivorous plant is devouring people on their ship. It's only until there's one left that they are actually forced to get involved. Up until that point, most of the episode is just these astronauts getting picked off in hallucinations, which again are driven by sex for some reason. This culminates in one of the most bizarre images I have ever seen in a TV show. What is that? What the fuck is that? The next episode which I found the most enjoyable was Norb, when the Lex crew encounters a boy they previously met in the episode White Trash. But here he has been killed and converted into drones controlled by Mantrid, who is now merged with an insect brain and is in the process of destroying the entire universe. This was a pretty decent thing loose on the ship episode. The concept of Mantrid's drones as the show's version of the von Neumann machines is pretty cool. We've seen this idea in the form of nanomachines, but the idea of floating arms literally ripping objects and life forms with their bare hands apart lends a usually cosmic event a refreshing morbidness. It's a simple concept, but it's generally well executed. Unfortunately, Lex rarely manages to be this truly exciting, but this episode does pull it off. The two-parter, The Web and The Net, was really odd. It's a two-parter with really only enough footage for a one-and-a-half-parter, if that. The Lex encounters a giant life form which traps the ship and attempts to take over the minds of the crew. As someone who hates spiders, this thing can fuck right off, but the episode generally succeeds in having a truly creepy atmosphere. There's an unsettling quality to the events where you as a viewer know something isn't quite right. I was truly curious to see what was going to happen next. But then the following episode was almost an exact repeat of part one, with only about five minutes of new footage. We watch everything we just saw again, but this time we know Tweedle has been taken over by this creature. Yeah, okay, fine twist, but did we really have to watch almost the entire previous episode again, just with alternate versions of certain scenes? Then when the characters finally do something new, the problem gets resolved with a simple foot stomp. The web built up some honest-to-god intrigue, and then the net just deflated all that tension again. I don't think I've ever seen a show turn a two-part episode into filler, but Lex is full of surprises, I guess. 
Brigadoom was an episode I anticipated hating, but it might actually be my favourite Lex episode so far. While trying to escape Mantrid's drones at the centre of the universe, they encounter a strange troupe of actors performing a musical about the history of Kai's homeworld. The last time there was a musical number in Lex, I wanted to cut my own ears off, but I was kinda taken in by this one. The show didn't have the budget to show this history in flashbacks, and Kai isn't exactly talkative, so conveying this exposition as a musical weirdly makes sense. Michael McManus and Xenia Seberg are actually pretty good singers, and the other songs are quite good in general, even if the lyrics are a little simplistic. I will say the one truly excellent element of Lex is the Brunin G song Yo Way Yo. No idea if it actually means anything, but it certainly sounds like something authentic from a real culture. And holy shit, Stanley Tweedle actually grew some balls by the end. I really didn't expect the musical episode to be the best episode of this show so far, but on this occasion, the inherent weirdness of Lex coalesced into something truly original and engrossing. I feel like this is what the show is trying to go for most of the time, but always seems to fall short. The final episodes in which the Lex crew finally confront Mantrid as the universe comes to an end gets an A for effort, I suppose. While reflecting on Lex, I really think the biggest problem it has is the direction. The scale of this story, the strangeness of its world despite its limited budget and poor VFX, could have delivered an exciting and thrilling finale. The direction is just so lifeless and the pace so sluggish. There is no momentum to this conflict, no passion in its visual storytelling. On my previous video, I got loads of comments saying I quote, just didn't get it, or that I shouldn't quote, compare Lex to other shows. But here we have our protagonists, a ragtag group of misfits, facing down the main villain, a staggeringly powerful maniac bent on the destruction of the universe itself. I don't need to have seen other sci-fi shows to have some reasonable expectations for this finale, but the majority of the time I was just sort of bored by it. We already know this isn't the only universe in the show's setting, so it wasn't exactly a surprise when the Lex survives by ending up in the Dark Zone again the same place they ended up in at the end of season 1. I'm sorry to say Lex fans, but I am just as meh on the show as I was in my previous video. If it's your jam, I'm glad you found whatever enjoyment I'm clearly missing. Season 3 is only 13 episodes, so maybe, and that's a big maybe, I'll check it out. But when it comes to sci-fi shows from this era, I have a lot more which I will happily spend my time on instead of this. Bill Fisher asks, how do you rank the designs of the USS Enterprise? If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know I'd put the Enterprise J right at the bottom. I think that is just a horrible looking ship. I'm also not the biggest fan of the Sovereign class, although I don't actively dislike it. I love the Galaxy class from TNG and obviously love the Constitution class. I will say though, the refit Enterprise from the motion picture to Undiscovered Country is probably my least favourite variation of the Constitution. I don't like the thin nacelles. I much prefer the round cylindrical nacelles in the other designs. I can't really choose between the others really. I love the updated version in Discovery, I also really like the sleekness of the Kelvin Enterprise, but I can't presently decide on a number one design. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members, where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.